Well, we're going to open our Bibles. We're going to get into the promises of God. And I just want to recap for you that God is a promise-keeping God. And we need to remember that. You can check his character. You can check his track record. And he's got a promise for almost every situation. When the devil tries to beat you up or take you down, you reply with a promise. When people are discouraging to you or not encouraging enough or you feel like what you're doing isn't working, you reply with a promise. Or even when you feel like your circumstances aren't going the way that you are hoping that they would, you reply with a promise. We've learned that the Lord is faithful. We've learned that God will deliver us. And today we have a new promise that we'll talk about. But I want you to know when we follow God's commands, we can stand on his promises. A lot of the promises of Scripture have some sort of command attached to it, and that's just the way that God works. We say, God, I want you uh, to give me all the desires of my heart. Well, the same scripture says we have to take delight in the Lord. And so some promises are just promises. And some promises look like a promise without a command, but it, it takes some effort from us. I don't know if anyone ever told you that as soon as you start following Jesus, it's not going to be an easy road. But you will get to the end. You'll get there, and it's going to take some work, and that'll be a promise we talk about today. But Paul said this to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 1. He said, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Doesn't matter how big of a promise, how small of a promise, how impossible of a promise it looks, the answer is already yes, it's going to happen. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. It says, no matter what, the promises are yes and amen what I want is that these promises, however many we go through, I want them to speak truth in your life and in your situation. When our response is amen to a promise of God, it reflects a change in our mentality. We go from, I hope God's going to do this, and we start saying, God's going to keep his promise. And so today's promise, I have to say, is a little personal for me. It may be one of the very first Bible verses that I memorized that I had to hold on to. Now, there are some Bible verses that I memorized because I'll just be honest, if I memorized it, I got candy at church. And that's why I memorized it. I can't tell you what it means, what context it's in. I just know one of the first ones I memorized was the King James Version of Psalm 23 because I got a badge as a Royal Ranger as a kid. And if I did that, I got my badge. And I also got candy. And I also got a pizza party. And so I would memorize Bible verses at camp. Youth camp, I did Bible quiz because we were told that if we went through the Bible quiz season and we memorized a lot, then we also got pizza or we got a party. But I remember right when I was called into ministry, when I was in Bible college and I was really struggling with why would God choose me? Why would God do this? This was one of the first verses of the Bible that I memorized and that I would use and I still use it today. And I'll be honest with you. I still need this verse probably now more than ever. So uh, I'm just going to say this. This is found in the first chapter of the book of Philippians. If you read the book of Philippians, it's a letter that Paul writes to the church in Philippi. And it's very easy to just roll over this promise because it's just part of the greeting. And some of you, you know, if, if there's a video greeting or the beginning of a letter, you're like, yeah, 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 get to the good stuff. But Paul always gets right to the good stuff at the beginning. So this is what he says in Philippians 1. This is our promise today. He says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I don't even know why I read that off my pad, but I know this. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he's going to be the one that's going to carry it on to completion. Here's the promise. It's really simple. What God starts, he finishes. What he starts, he finishes. It's as simple as that. I had my mom drill this into me. I had mentors drill this into me. My very first Bible that I took to Bible college, I felt like if I was going to Bible college, you can't just have a small Bible. You have to have a really thick Bible, a really bound leather black Bible with my name in the beginning. And it, I mean, it's beat up and I got stuff underlined all over the place. But that was the first Bible that I felt like was mine. And that was the first verse that I underlined. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he's going to carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, I have very distinct memories as a kid of learning the value. I don't know if this is going to bring some bad memories up for some of you, but this is my mom, especially, and my grandpa and my dad. I learned the value of finishing what you start. 
I was always told, and it was drilled into my mind and into my heart, that you do not quit. Anyone else's parents tell them, don't quit? All the time. I see some moms looking at their kids now like, I've told you this, so you should be raising your hand. I was told this with everything. Schoolwork, when I would throw my pencil in frustration, when I, it, when I got a new job and I didn't like the hours, you don't quit. Uh, sports, especially as a kid. My mom is still competitive. My dad is. My grandpa is still competitive. I mean, they were just, when I was a kid, I felt like I was performing for them and nobody else. And I was always told, if you start a season, you finish it. And they would always say, you know, in this family, we don't quit. Well, I remember when baseball, well, when it went from t-ball to baseball, it got a little bit harder. And then all of a sudden, when the coaches weren't pitching to you anymore and kids were pitching to you, and then when you became a teenager, and then all of a sudden that ball's moving really fast and it's, it's hard enough and there's a chance that the coach might give you the, you know, the signal that you're going to take the pitch. And for me, I was always in the, in the lineup where um, there was a good hitter before me and a great hitter after me. And so I got that sign a lot. You know, hey, Eric, I need you to take this pitch. Basically meaning you can't hit it very far. You may strike out, so I want you to just lean into it, and then you get your base, and then the kid behind you, he's going to clean up. Well, I didn't like that. I did not like that role. I, I loved being a catcher. I was a catcher, so I understood, you know, the lineup. I knew how to get people on base. I knew what to tell the pitcher. But when it came, came time for me to bat, I saw my name in the lineup, and, and I didn't even – now, I'm a lefty, and so sometimes my back was to my coach – and he would have this whistle that he would do, and, and I knew what that whistle meant. It wasn't just a sign. It was, you're taking a pitch. And so, I, I mean, some of the kids on the other teams were my friends in high school and in, in middle school, and, and they understood, um, you know, maybe last game, Spaniard took a pitch, so I'm going to make this one hurt a little bit. So, and they did. I got nice welts on my back and my arm, and I just grew tired of that. And I remember this very vividly. I was laying on the floor in my grandparents' Uh, house. It was baseball season. It was a Tuesday night. I was eating lunch, eating dinner with my grandparents and my dad. And I felt like calling my coach in the middle of the season and quitting. I had a game on Wednesday. I did not want to go. I knew that maybe my dad would be a little bit more lenient and just kind of say, hey, whatever you want to do. But I knew I better call my mom and tell her that I want to quit. And I remember this phone call. She says, you don't quit. You started this season. You're not going to quit. We, we don't quit. Don't be a quitter. Well, what I did is I called my coach, and I told him that I'm not playing the rest of the season, and I quit. I quit right in the middle of the baseball season. And now this truth has stuck with me my whole life. I remember that moment that I, I felt like I let my mom down. I let my family down. I mean, I wasn't that great of a baseball player that I was one day going to play for the Yankees or something. But I felt like I let people down. Now, I may not be the best at what I do, but I'll never forget how that felt to quit. And I always will try my best and I'll try hard not to quit. Whenever I start something, however long that may take, I work as hard as I can for as long as I can. I try not to quit. We are trying to teach this to our children, especially when we might be playing a family game together and they happen to be losing. We don't quit. Now I find comfort in the fact that God operates the same way. He doesn't quit. He doesn't give up. Whatever God starts, and I mean that, whatever he starts, he finishes. When he begins something in the world, in a plan, in a purpose, whenever he begins something in you or in something in me, this promise says that he's going to carry it on to completion. So what good work has God started? What is Paul talking about? He's simply talking. It's not simply. It's a big idea, but he's talking about our salvation. See, God's work for us began... When Jesus died on the cross in our place. Now, I think we know that. We say amen to that. That's a huge part of what we believe as Christians. But I sometimes think we take that for granted. That he took our place. He died in our spot. He took our punishment in order to give us salvation. That was the moment salvation became secure. But in that moment, I want you to put yourself in the disciples' shoes, in the people who were on the earth at that time, people who started to believe in Jesus, but maybe were ashamed of it, people like Nicodemus, who was a high priest and, and really wanted to follow Jesus, but he didn't want to lose his position. And people, I mean, it was gaining momentum. And then all of a sudden, 
It looked like God's plan for the salvation of Israel. It was not brought to completion. I want to take you back to the death of Jesus. We know the death of Jesus. We hold fast to that because if Jesus died, that means he rose from the dead. But this is where we have to put ourselves in their shoes. Let's talk about Jesus being arrested in the garden for something he didn't do. In Matthew chapter 26, it, it simply says this. In the, in the craziest time in Jesus' life, when he felt betrayed, it says all of the disciples deserted him and they fled. When he needed them the most, they were gone. What about the religious leaders that Jesus was mocked by after his arrest? It says this in the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders, they mocked him. They said he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and then we'll believe in him. What mockery for this Messiah that I'll just say this, these chief priests and teachers of the law, they should have been ecstatic that the Messiah was here, but they missed him. And then Jesus is on the cross about to secure salvation for all of us. And this is what Jesus says. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. He says this in Aramaic, which means he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Even he's wrestling with the fact of, is this really how you want this to go down? A few verses later, I want you to catch what it says. First time I caught this, Matthew 27, verse 50, it says, When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Never saw that before. He gave up. He gave up his spirit. Then Jesus declares the finish in John 19. He says, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, the death of Jesus, they take him down from the cross. They bury him in a tomb. It's darkness. A lot of the disciples returned back to their jobs. These men and women who are ready to give their lives for Jesus. Even one of them said, I'll never betray you. I will give my life for you. Well, he snuck away after cutting somebody's ear off, denied his best friend, and went back to fishing. That sounds like a great friend. When you need him the most, he not only cuts somebody's ear off, but then he acts like he doesn't even know you. We know what happens next. We know the resurrection of Jesus. We know that the Holy Spirit comes. We know that the church is born. We know that we're here today because of this moment. But if we put ourselves in their shoes, it looked like everything was over. God had finally started something. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years of waiting for the Savior, and now he's dead. It didn't have the ending that they imagined. It even says there that Jesus gave up. Some translations will say that he quit. He quit fighting. He gave up his spirit. Let's be really real for a moment. For these men, for these women, the Messiah that they had waited for, he was dead. All of his disciples had run away. All hope was gone. In fact, they were hiding. A lot of them feared that if they even remotely said that they knew who Jesus was, they would face the same death. It seems as if God did not finish what he started. But let me remind you of the promise. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What God starts, he finishes. Matthew 28, seems like we only read this on Easter Sunday, but I want you to hear this. The angel said to the women who were at the tomb, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. And I love these seven words. He is not here. He has risen. He's not here. He has risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. See, God's work for us began when Jesus died on the cross in our place. Even in that moment, if we're honest, it looked as if God's elaborate plan would never be finished. The Son of God had three years of public ministry. The people who should have loved him and respected him and supported his ministry the ones who put him to death. It looked like it was over. But that was only the beginning. Why? Because God's work for us began when Christ died. But God's work in us began when you and I first believed. Paul would write these words to the Roman church. 
that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be what? Saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and you are saved. This is the good work that God's going to carry on to completion. He's going to finish what he started in you and in me. Paul writes this to the church in Philippi. He says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, he says this, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. This is a big theological term called sanctification. It means that he's not done working on you yet. Now, there are some beliefs out there that, hey, once I'm saved, I'm always saved. I said that prayer as a five-year-old kid at that one camp. I don't even remember it, but now I can do whatever I want. No, this tells me that we work out that salvation with fear and trembling. We keep working on it. It reminds me of an old song that one of my professors used to sing in college, that he's still working on me to make me who I ought to be. It only took him a week to make the moon and the stars, but he's still working on me. Think about it. God created the universe, and in six days, he's like, that's it. With you, he's not done. You take a lot more patience and a lot more promises and a lot more hard work. I mean, the universe, six days, I'm done. Then he's like, ooh, there's Eric. He's got to still work on him. And Paul understood this. He, he did not want you to take that salvation for granted that God's work started in you. He says, listen, God's going to start something in you. He's going to finish it. But, man, you've got to work on it. You've got to work out that salvation with fear and trembling. God's going to work in you. You're going to want to act according to his purpose. Here's what I can say about the theological term of sanctification and, and how God keeps working. What he starts, he finishes. It's all about progress. We just keep making improvements day by day. I needed to hear something on a phone call with my mom the other day. She said, listen, she even brought up one of these verses. She said, listen, you just do what you can today. Because how, how much of the future can we actually control? I mean, we make calendars and watches and clocks and planners. I joked with you, probably the worst purchase anybody could have made in 2020 was a planner because that's gone. But how much can we, how much is really actually in our control? Even the Bible reminds us when it talks about the faithfulness of God that his mercies are new every morning. That means we're not even promised tomorrow. So let's just do what we can today. Let's act according to his purpose. When God starts a project, I want you to see that he completes it. I wish I had more time because I would take you all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when God started the project of salvation. He told Eve, he said, there's going to come one that's going to be born of a woman that's going to crush the head of the serpent. She had no idea what he was talking about, but that's the first prophecy of Jesus. Then he talks to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and to Joseph and to Moses and to Joshua. And all throughout the old, he keeps reminding them, I'm, I'm starting something. I'm going to keep working on it. It's going to be step by step by step. And then they thought the project was over when Jesus was here. And he said, the Messiah is here. I'm here to set the captives free. And then he died. But he kept working. God will not give up on us. If you think you've messed up, I just want you to go read the Old Testament story of Jacob. Because that is a crazy family. Or read the story of Joseph. We love the story of Joseph, but we don't realize how evil his brothers were to him. We think that Moses is this great Old Testament leader, and he is, but God told him to do something, and he did the opposite. And God's like, well, I'm sorry, you can't see the promised land now. Talk about the craziest book in the Old Testament, the book of the Judges. It says that they did whatever they thought was right in their own eyes, and God kept working on them. And then they still didn't listen, so God kept sending prophet after prophet after say, hey, listen, I kept telling you to follow, and then they didn't, and they sent them away to captivity, and God did not give up on them. If the Bible is a reminder of anything, it's this promise, what God starts, he's going to finish. So if you think that he's going to give up on you, he can't. He promises to finish the work that he begins. So you can't let your present condition rob you of the joy of knowing and following Jesus, because if he started something, he's going to finish it. So here's how I want to make this real 
applicable for all of us. I wanted to say something simple and so that you could understand, and I feel like it's too simple, but that's just the Bible teacher in me. I feel like I've got to roll out all of these Greek and theological things. Listen, if God's not going to give up on us, don't you dare give up on him. If he's not going to give up on you, don't you dare give up on him. That's what this promise means to me. That if he's going to start something in me and he's going to carry it on to completion and it may take all the way until Jesus Christ returns, why in the world would I give up on him? If God finishes what he starts, then you and I need to do the same thing in our relationship with God. I feel like I'm saying this as my grandpa and my mom, don't you dare be a quitter when it comes to your relationship with God. Don't do it. Because why? Because the Holy Spirit lives in us. And it will enable us to be more and more like Jesus every day. If you feel overwhelmed, how do you think Peter and James and John and all those guys felt when the Savior of the world is gone? And then he said something like, well, it's actually better if I leave because I'm going to send you my spirit and you're going to do more things than I've ever done. If that was said to me, I'd be like, you picked the wrong person. But the church was born. Anytime the Holy Spirit showed up, it said God would add more to their number every day. Things changed because God said, I'm not giving up on you. Peter gave up on Jesus. He, he gave up on that relationship, but Jesus didn't give up on Peter. And he said, Peter, on your faith, I'm going to build the church. Peter preached his very first sermon. I remember my first sermon. I'm glad there's not a recording of it. But Peter's first sermon was so eloquent. I mean, he summarized the whole Old Testament, and it said the Spirit fell and 3,000 people got saved. That's a pretty good start to a church. Because Peter didn't give up. He kept going. Here's the truth, though. Following Jesus and following his plan for our lives, I might get a resounding amen for this one. Following him is tough. It's real tough. We're going to hit roadblocks. We're going to hit hurdles, setbacks, disappointments. We're going to fail. But if this promise is anything, it's a call to us to not quit and to not give up. We do whatever we can so that God can finish what he started being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he's going to carry it until completion, until the day of Christ Jesus. Here's what Bible scholars will say about this verse. Tucked away in a greeting of a letter, it's the definition of a true Christian. It's a call to perseverance. It's a call to keep walking with Jesus no matter what we face. It could be an internal struggle. It could be an external problem. But this is saying you keep going. You keep persevering. Paul talks about perseverance all the time. He said it actually produces character. It produces hope. It produces the kind of person that you should be. This is his saying it again. Hey, God started something. He's going to complete it. I feel like Paul is saying to us today, don't you dare quit. It doesn't mean that we're not going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean that we're not going to struggle. As people would say, the struggle is very real. It's hard. But here's where we miss it sometimes. We feel like we make a mistake. We feel like we have a setback, a disappointment. I even hear people say, like, you just don't understand. Hey, you know, if I told you what I did, then you wouldn't even want me to, to, God wouldn't want me to be anywhere near him. I've heard people say, man, if I go to church, the, the building's just going to collapse because of who I am. I said, no, that building's not really dependent on, on you. The presence of God can take it. Here's what it means. If you, you may make a mistake, a struggle, a disappointment, a setback, a failure. But here's what the Bible tells us. It means we live a life of repentance. It means you turn away from what you were doing. Doesn't mean you might not turn back there again because I can give you story after story in Scripture of people that kept going back. But you keep repenting. You keep re returning to Jesus. We keep moving forward until we meet Jesus. Because being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, he's going to carry it to completion. So here's the big question I have. Because I struggle with this too. Why, why do we keep going? Because sometimes it looks like our efforts are just not going anywhere. Following Jesus isn't getting any of the return that we thought. The blessings aren't there. The faithfulness we feel like isn't getting rewarded. We don't follow Jesus for that. But sometimes it's really nice to be faithful to God. And then all of a sudden he's like, okay, now I'll answer your prayer. Why do we keep going? We keep going. We can because he does. We do it because that's what God does. If we needed an example of a character, of a person 
We go to Jesus. We keep going because he kept going. He finishes what he starts. This relationship we have with God, it's marked by grace, which means God gives you forgiveness and you don't even deserve it. It might be a quiet amen because you don't want to act like, well, I need more grace than that person. But he's going to keep giving it to you. You don't deserve it. He's going to be patient with you. There's nothing that we can do that's going to cause God to love us any less. Paul tells the Roman church, he says, listen, while you were still a sinner, what he was really saying is while you were far away from Jesus and gave him no attention at all, there's a very clear promise in Scripture that he still died for you. It's not as if, okay, now I believe in Jesus and Jesus, okay, says, oh, okay, now I'll die for you. No, it's while we were still far away from him, he died for us. There's nothing that we're going to do that's going to cause God to love us any less or to give up on us. We can keep going because he does. But I've heard people ask this too. I'm trying to come at it from every argument you might try to be giving me right now. Here's a question. Has God given up on me? Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you walked away. Maybe you just stopped pursuing Jesus altogether. Maybe you stopped believing or your belief hit a cap because something horrible happened to you. Maybe you stopped making church a priority. Maybe you stopped reading your Bible. Maybe you stopped making that a priority. Maybe you stopped praying altogether because you said, I can't even talk to him. Maybe you altogether stopped making your relationship with Jesus a priority. Maybe you decided to quit. Has God given up on us? Well, I want to share a promise with you, if you haven't heard it enough. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I don't know who needs to hear this, but he's not done with you. He's not done. You might feel like you've quit, you've made too many mistakes, you've walked away, you've stopped pursuing things, you... And then you come into a place or you start opening your Bible or things start happening. People start calling you, texting you, saying, I'm praying for you. How are you doing? And you're like, no, no, no. God's done with me. He's not done with you. He's not. Even if you've tried to be done with him, he's not going to stop pursuing you. You might wonder if his love and his grace have worn out on you. Because sometimes if we're honest, you know, as parents or trying to be patient with people, we're like, oh, man, my patience is running thin. My mom used to say, boy, you are on thin ice. I didn't know what that meant until I became a parent. I know what thin ice means now. The ice between you and God, man, that's thick. He's got a lot of pain. He's not done. You just keep repenting and you keep running back to Jesus. If there's any scripture that I can give you, it's the parable of the lost son. That son thought he was done. He came back and he said, you know what, if I, if, you know, I, I've squandered everything. I made my dad's name look bad. I, I wasted all, of, all that he's given, all this love and, and grace that this father has given to this son. He says, I'm going to go home and I'm not even going to ask him to be a son anymore. I'll just ask him to be a servant because at least maybe that's what I'm worthy of. And so he's practicing this speech and he comes back. It's found in Luke 15. And then what happens is that the father is waiting for him and runs to him. And in that story, God is the father and we are that son that feels like we can't even come home. He's waiting for you. He's pacing on the porch waiting for you. The Holy Spirit is in us. It means that God's going to finish what he started. So I feel like I'll give like a pregame speech here that I'm sure my mom tried to give to me when I quit baseball. When it gets tough, keep going. When you're discouraged, keep going. You don't let this relationship you have with God, you do not let it fizzle out and turn into a life of regret. And what if I did that? You let God finish what he started in you. And so I quit baseball when I was probably 10 or 11 because I kept getting pitches and I didn't like it. But I, I didn't stop playing sports. I wrestled in high school. And then I made this really weird choice to go for cross country. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know... Why I thought I would enjoy a sport where all you do is run. But I got pretty good at running and and wrestling because that's how we started every practice. We just ran for like a half hour or an hour. I was like, well, if I can do that, then I'll just put these, you know, little number on my shirt. I'll wear these shorts that, you know, it says my high school and I can run. You know, a mile and a half isn't that bad. Well, I did that in middle school and then I wanted to go out for the high school team. And I realized you don't do a mile and a half, you do 3.2 miles. And that just, I didn't like that. 
So I remember the last year in middle school, I was on the cross country team. Uh, I still don't know why to this day. So people are like, why did you do cross country? I, I don't know why people do cross country now. If you like to run and you just keep beating yourself up like that, more power to you. I got sympathy for you because I thought we were just going to run in a circle. But cross country is across the country, up and down hills, through mud. And, and I thought because one time it was going to rain that we weren't going to run that day. And the coach just laughed at me. So that meant that we were running that day. But I remember this race, it was like an invitational that we were, all of us are going to be done on the middle school team. And the next year we were going to go to the high school team where our coach either forgot to tell us or he intentionally didn't tell us that we were going to go to a high school course on a middle school team. So my brain, my body, my training was ready for a mile and a half. Well, we get there and he's like, hey guys, just wanted to let you know, I believe in you. And I'm like, oh great, here we go. When a coach says, I believe in you, you're about to do something you've never done before. You're about to face an undefeated team or you're about to face the best pitcher in baseball. I believe in you. Well, he said, I believe in you guys. You can handle this 3.2 mile course today. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, I would never say that. I'm a rule follower. So if we were running 3.2 miles, that's what I was going to do. Well, this was an invitational, five or six different other middle schools and high schools. And I knew that day that they were going to place people. You, sometimes on an invitational, you get prizes with where you place. Well, they had numbered popsicle sticks that you would get when you would cross the finish line. And so your goal obviously was to get, you know, a very low number. You wanted to be in the top 10 or top 15. Well, about the mile and a half point, I wanted to quit. And my mom was there, so you may know where this is going. She found me on the course, because I'll just be honest with you, I just started walking. I started talking to myself. I'm like, this is stupid. I hate this. I'm not going out for high school cross country. I don't know why I signed up for this. And she found me on the course. My mom found me on the course and she started yelling at me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm done. I'm quitting. I'm just going to just go get the car. I told this to my mom, go get the car ready. I'm not even going back. I don't need my bag. I don't need my stuff. They can keep my water bottle. I don't care. Go get the car. I'm done. I'm quitting. And wouldn't you know, she, I love my mom for this. She'll probably love hearing this story. She started walking the course with me. And she said, you're not quitting. I said, Mom, I just want to let you know that I'm going to be that kid that gets the last popsicle stick, even if there's any left. And everybody's going to know that Eric finished last. And I just, I don't want to do that. I probably started crying a little bit. I'll be honest with you. I said, Mom, I don't want to finish this because I, I can't. I don't, I'm not strong enough to finish this. Now, she didn't walk right beside me, but man, she's like following me on the course. And I'm like, why can't there be like a, a covered area like with trees where she can't come in? And she's just saying, you're not giving up. You're not going to quit. We don't quit what we start. And I'll never forget that day. She walked alongside of me. I would run, then I would walk, and then you know, I'd put my hands over my head to make it feel like I, I don't know if that actually helps or not. But, but she stayed with me. And, and the final leg of the race was you, you finish on a track. And I mean, there was like nobody left. I just had this dream of like a Disney movie that my team would be there. Like, let's go, Eric. Come on, you can finish. And nobody was there. The blue tent was there. I think some nice lady was there. And she had the last popsicle stick. And I tried to run as hard as I could. And I finished the race that day. And I got that last popsicle stick. And I wish I still had it somewhere. I know I kept it for a while. But that story kept running through my head as I was preparing this week. And I feel like some of you need to know that you might feel like me on that course, that you've hit your limit, that you just want to quit. And you know who's going to come over the horizon? Someone like my mom, and that's God. And he's going to remind you of this promise, and he's going to say, listen, you're not quitting. Because I began something, and I'm going to finish it, and I need you to do your part. So I will tell you this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you. I wish I could add stuff to scripture. I'm not going to do that, but I feel like I, I want you to hear this, that he who began a good work in you, if you need it, he'll finish the race right next to you. He'll walk it with you. He is not going to let you give up. He can't. And so you can't. Why do we keep going? Because he keeps going. He finishes what he starts. So I don't know if you've ever been motivated by a numbered popsicle stick, but a lot of you need to hear that what Paul would say at the end of his life, we feel like one of the last letters, letters he wrote, he said this, I have finished the race. I have fought the good fight. I'm ready to receive the crown of eternal life. 
I want to say that at the end of my life. I want that for you because, listen, the promise is this. What God starts, he finishes. So if you need a cheerleader next to you to help you with this race, call out to God. Sometimes he's going to seem like this mom who won't let you go to tell you you're not quitting. I'm not done with you yet. And so I want to pray for all of you. Would you stand as we close today? Because I want you to know God started something in all of us. God has started something in this church. I know a lot of churches are are facing a lot of unknowns right now and leaders. But man, listen, none of this crazy stuff going on took God by surprise. It may not be part of the plan that we wanted. But when God starts something, he's going to finish it. And I need to hear this a lot too is that When God said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It may look different. It may not feel the same. But I I just want you to know what God starts, he finishes. So maybe you feel like, you know what, I, I wanted to quit. Maybe you feel like quitting now. I want to pray for you. And if, man, if that's you, you can just raise your hands in like a surrender to God and say, you know what, God, I'm not giving up anymore. That's me. I'm doing it. Lord, we come to you now. And we claim this promise, that we can be confident in this, that he who began a good work in us, he's going to carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God, I pray for all of us in here that may have faced some setbacks, some disappointments, some failures. Maybe we walked away. Maybe we were running the race and we had every intention of finishing as best as we could and we just started walking. Or maybe we started walking to the car to say, I'm done. I quit. I don't want to even finish this. But God, I thank you for that day that my mom showed up in the middle of a cross-country course and said, you're not quitting. Because God, I needed that reminder this week that you do the same to us. Right in the middle of our race, you'll come over the hill and you'll say, you're not quitting. You're not giving up. I know it doesn't seem like it's going to finish right now. I know every situation that you thought was secure, it's not secure right now. But you're not giving up. You're not going to quit. Because I began something in you and I'm going to carry it on to completion. So God, help us. Help us to work out our salvation. Help us to want to do the things that you have for us. That good and perfect and pleasing will that you have for our lives. God, I pray that you would remind us again and again of this promise. That what you start, you finish. God, we thank you for those in our lives who are in their eternal home right now. God, they finished their race. Remind us of their perseverance. Remind us of the perseverance of the people around us. And if we have nobody around us, God, help us to dive into your word. And you keep revealing to us person after person that persevered until the end. God, we want to get to the end of our lives, whenever that may be, and say, I have finished the race. I have fought the good fight. And now I'm ready for my eternal reward. Bless us, Lord, this week and every day. God, I pray that for those of us that feel like quitting, that you would give us an extra dose of energy, extra empowerment from the Holy Spirit to keep going. Thank you, Lord, that what you start, you finish. God, we are not quitting. We are not giving up. We pray that in Jesus' wonderful and powerful name, and everybody said together, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for joining us online. We'll see.